managing diabetic ketoacidosis, well, it demands real precision. We're aiming to correct high blood sugar and acidosis, of course. Right, but just as importantly, preventing low blood sugar. That's a major goal. Exactly, and there's a strategy using both long-acting subcutaneous insulin and regular intravenous insulin. It seems to offer better results. Let's uh, get into why. Okay, so standard treatment typically involves infusing intravenous insulin, usually at um, 0.1 units per kilogram per hour. And dextrose comes in when glucose drops. Yes, when it falls below about 250 milligrams per deciliter, we add dextrose to the fluids. Now, historically, that switch, you know, from intravenous to subcutaneous insulin, that could be tricky. It really could. Patients sometimes had these gaps in insulin coverage, which isn't ideal. But newer findings are uh, shifting how we handle that transition now. Definitely. Starting the long-acting subcutaneous insulin while the intravenous insulin is still running, that significantly lowers the risk of hypoglycemia. That's a huge improvement for patient safety right there. It is. And combining subcutaneous glargine, for instance, with the intravenous insulin seems to speed up resolving the acidosis too. Faster resolution. In adults and kids. In both, yes. It's a significant benefit. Plus, using that subcutaneous basal insulin early helps prevent blood sugar from shooting back up that rebound hyperglycemia after the intravenous drip stops. Okay, so practically speaking for clinicians listening, when should they actually give that subcutaneous dose? What's the window? Good question. The recommendation is typically two to six hours before you plan to stop the intravenous insulin infusion. Two to six hours beforehand. And what if the patient's already on basal insulin at home? You generally just continue their usual dose. Keep it consistent. Makes sense. And for patients starting it for the first time? For those new to it, an initial subcutaneous basal dose is often around 0.15 to 0.3 units per kilogram, usually given once or twice daily. And I imagine monitoring during this overlap period is absolutely essential. Oh, absolutely. You need hourly glucose monitoring during that transition. Very important. Right, because you might need to adjust the dextrose infusion too. Exactly. You might need to tweak the dextrose infusion rate to prevent glucose from dropping too low. In quality improvement projects, they back this up, this optimized overlap. They do. They show it minimizes those insufficient transitions, those gaps we talked about. And importantly, this approach doesn't seem to increase the risk of low potassium. Or longer hospital stays. Or longer hospital stays, correct. That's key. That's definitely reassuring. So the data really supports combining them like that. Yes. Studies specifically looking at co-administration, say with glargine, show it significantly cuts down on that rebound hyperglycemia. And the safety profile looks good overall. It does. When you time that subcutaneous dose correctly, combining it with the intravenous insulin doesn't appear to increase the risk of low blood sugar or low potassium. So it's not just safer in terms of glucose stability, but maybe more efficient too. That's what the evidence suggests. This combined strategy could potentially shorten the time it takes to actually resolve the DKA. Which might mean shorter stays in the intensive care unit. Possibly, yes. It could lead to shorter ICU stays and you know, things like electronic health record alerts can be useful here. How so? Well, they can help remind teams and ensure everyone adheres to these uh, overlap guidelines consistently. Right, prompts for timing and checks. Makes sense. Exactly. So wrapping this up then, it sounds like incorporating subcutaneous long-acting insulin early during DKA treatment is a safe and effective strategy. That's the bottom line. It really helps stabilize patients. And makes that transition off the intravenous insulin much smoother. Smoother. And it helps prevent those potentially dangerous swings in blood sugar. So adopting these kinds of evidence-based protocols really stands to improve patient recovery and cut down on potential complications. Absolutely. It represents a positive shift in managing this serious condition. A really valuable adjustment to standard practice. 